Hey folks, I just wanted to take this moment to let you know about a new thing that we are doing here called Mindful Mondays. And basically the idea surrounding this is there's all this talk about how brutal Mondays can be and how hard Mondays are when we are starting our week. So what we've decided to do is curate some tips for you to use to make your week a little bit brighter. What you can do is you can go to thehumanxp.com slash mindful and sign up for our newsletter right there. It's for free and it's just a little something that you can add to your week at the beginning of the week that we've decided to compile for you guys. We think you'll really like it. Everyone that's on it now has expressed a lot of interest in it and we think it's going well so get to the humanxp.com slash mindful and get mindful every monday thank you so much for listening welcome to the human experience podcast the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet as we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. There was at least one to three times where... I was in full breakdown, you know, like I was breaking down. I had to leave the room and I mean, there were a lot of people there and, and I just, and I just couldn't bear to be in that. Why, why do you think that type of reaction happens? Yeah, I, I appreciate your vulnerability, Xavier, uh, that uh, you see that you were using different grungy states of being or even physical states to, to avoid being present with some painful realities. The, the quality of our communication is the quality of our life. So in any environment where we work, where we play, where we serve, where we pray, there's communication. And even, or especially when we're with ourselves, sometimes listening is compared to life air. Understanding is compared to life air. Just like if I get the wind knocked out of me. And I'm gasping for breath. Well, at that moment, you, you could offer me a pile of money. You could offer me my favorite meal. It, it won't matter, Xavier. It, it, it won't matter because all I want is air. So similarly, often, especially in emotionally charged situations uh, around resentment, hurt, fear, anxiety, woundedness, especially in emotionally charged situations, sometimes all we really want is to be understood to know myself, self-awareness, and to communicate my experience and my realization such that the other person or group of persons get me and they're impacted. It is said, in the beginning was the word. So just as the Supreme creates with the word, we get to take a look, what am I creating in my life with my word? What's up, folks? Xavier Katana here, and such a great episode with Dr. David B. Wolf. He is the author of a book called Relationships That Work, The Power of Conscious Living. We talk about communication in this episode. We talk about authenticity. We talk about uh, the importance of our word. We, t- we talk about setting expectations. We talk about everything related to the communication that a person has with themselves and others we really hope that you guys enjoy this conversation as much as i did Uh, please find us on twitter at the human xp facebook and youtube of the same name thank you guys so much for listening here is dr david wolf The human experience is in session. My guest for today is Dr. David Wolf. David, it's a pleasure, sir. Welcome to the human experience. Thank you, Xavier. So, David, we like to start the show off with kind of getting an introduction for what our guests do. If you could just sort of give us a brief synopsis of of who you are and what you do, please. I'm uh, the director of Safatov Institute. I uh, 
co-developed many courses, uh, communication-based transformational seminars I'm based in Florida, and I conduct them around the world. Also, I direct the Safatov Institute School of Transformative Coaching. It's a school of professional coaching, and so I, I train coaches, I train facilitators, and uh, for example, just in the past month, I've conducted Safatov seminars in the Czech Republic and in North Florida. I also write. I know you have a copy of my book. And that's some of what I do. So the focus here is, is communication. This is what you're focused on, right? Yes. I like to use the term a communication-based approach to self-realization. So we are focused on, on cultivating mastery, cultivating expertise in communication, not just for the sake of collecting a, a set of skills, but cultivating excellence in communication to establish an environment within ourselves and in our relationships that is conducive and inspiring for enhanced self-awareness and self-discovery. Hmm. Okay. Wow. Okay. So what's going on when two people are effectively communicating? What's the difference between someone that is waiting for their turn to speak and effectively communicating with another person? Effectively communicating, the way I see that, is that if I'm effectively communicating, then I'm clear and connected first with myself, and I'm communicating my experience and my message and my message effectively, such that you get me, such that you understand me cognitively, and more than that, you get me who I am as a human being or more precisely as a spiritual being having a human experience. Hmm. So effective communication means to know myself, self-awareness, and to communicate my experience and my realization such that the other person or group of persons get me and they're impacted. So there's a level of understanding that's happening through that communication that, that the person communicating is responsible for? Yes. Yes. It's one level of communication where I'm responsible for what I communicate, for sure. And a higher level is that I'm responsible for how my communication is received and perceived. Okay. So let's build this out for our audience. You know, what's happening in a dialogue that indicates to you an effective communication is happening? Is there something that you notice, an understanding? Is there a perceptual shift that you notice? There's understanding, as you said, and there's connection that all parties involved in the communication are coming to life more fully with more vitality and radiance because there's connection of souls. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's bringing to life speaker and listener. There's something that you say often, uh, which is to communicate or to really be heard, you first have to listen, right? Am I, I'm, I'm juggling that quote a little bit. But what is the quote that you use often? The, the, philo the philosopher Paul Tillich said, the first duty of love is to listen. And for me, there's a related quote, people don't care what you know till they know that you care. Right. A great way to show that you care is to listen, that if I express myself and you're willing to reserve your judgments, advice, praise, you're willing to reserve your argument, your reassurance to show that you're understanding what I've said, then I'm much more likely to be open to hear your perspective and your point of view compared to if, well, I'm left there and you're, you're giving me your suggestion, your advice, your warning, your, your point of view, but I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes listening is compared to life air. Understanding is compared to life air. Just like if I get the wind knocked out of me and I'm gasping for breath. Well, at that moment, you, you could offer me a pile of money. You could <laughs> offer me my favorite meal. It, it won't matter. Xavier, it, it, it won't matter because all I want is air. 
So similarly, often, especially in emotionally charged situations uh, around resentment, hurt, fear, anxiety, woundedness, especially in emotionally charged situations, sometimes all we really want is to be understood. And at such moments, even an apparently astute analysis or apparently sagely advice or praise it it won't resonate because all i it's understanding can be like life air you know in in full disclosure you know i i've taken the sattva tov course t- twice I, the first time i attempted to take it and i was there for a day and it you know it, it it's a really challenging process i mean it, it's it's a, a very immersive experience uh, yeah. i like to say but you know I am a different person because of it. And so the second time that I took it, I, I, I sort of forced myself. I, I wanted to make sure that I completed the course. That was my goal for that weekend. There was so much that I learned about communication, about relationships, not only with others, but with myself. Mm. So how does the aspect of communication work in relationship to oneself? How much of that are we... What's the right word here? It's sort of projecting onto others. First, I'll say I'm 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 encouraged to to hear what you expressed, Xavier. That uh, it was a challenging experience, and and you're changed. And I get that you're changed in the sense that like your experience of self and life and relations are are richer, fuller, and yeah. Our, our courses are designed to be challenging. They're designed to not be comfortable. They are designed to create a safe space to go to places that feel scary. And we do that through um, supporting everyone to cultivate mastery in communication with themselves and others that creates a safe and sacred space to explore any area of self, any area of life that perhaps in most arenas of our life we're scared to explore. I'm glad to hear about your experience and what you've what you're taking with you from your Safatov seminar experience. I, I know you in February you were in the Safatov Foundational Seminar that Marie Glashin and I co facilitated and uh here it's two months later, and I, I appreciate your sharing. And the spiritual principle is things go from subtle to external. It is said, the quality of our communication is the quality of our life. So in any environment where we work, where we play, where we serve, where we pray, there's communication. And even, or especially when we're with ourselves, if I'm a lo- we're, we're always communicating with ourselves. We're always talking with ourselves. And the spiritual principles, things go from subtle to external. And so, sure, if I'm communicating with myself, for example, Car- Carl Jung said, till we make the unconscious conscious, it'll direct our life mm. and we'll call it fate. Mm-hmm. And so let's say I'm communicating with myself. Uh, I'm not lovable. If people really knew me, they wouldn't like me, what to speak of love me, so I need to put on this facade. Or, I, I, Okay, well then I'm going to make that true. Again, maybe consciously or less than consciously, I'll things go from subtle to external. I'll create situations where ah, she rejected me again. See, he doesn't want me either. If I'm communicating with myself, I'm not trustworthy. I'm not reliable. I'll make that true. If I'm communicating my, with myself, I'm deserving of love and abundance to flow in in my life. Then that's going to show up. That's going to show up in my life. And so just completely consistent with what you said, the, the quality and nature and substance of our internal communication will certainly be reflected externally. Yeah, it's very powerful, your words. You know, I, and again, you know, there was no promotion involved with this conversation and, get, and bringing you onto the show. I, I wanted to bring you on because I find the nature of your work so intriguing. In the course, I think in the first day, we covered something that you call roadblocks to effective listening. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples of what would be considered a roadblock to effective listening and and what we're doing inside of communication that prevents listening effectively? 
our assumption in transformative communication in the Sattvato spirit of self-discovery is that each of us has what I'll call the highest guidance within, that I am not the expert in your life, and that we're each the expert in our own lives. And so our process is, is not to uh, take the role of the expert in someone's life. Our process is to, is to use our skills and application of principles of conscious living and conscious communication to support people to connect with that inner expertise, that highest guidance within. Mm -hmm. And so certainly in, in high-level effective human communication, there's, there's a place for advice. Also, though, often as an initial response to someone with an emotionally charged situation, as an initial response, advice can sometimes be a roadblock. Like, let's say if I go, oh, yeah, I don't know if I should go to grad school or get a job in the in the corporate world or travel the world. And then I go, oh, well, you sh this is definitely time to travel the world. And I just immediately give advice. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, that can sometimes be appropriate. But we want to take a look with the response we're giving. Advice can be a roadblock. Sympathy, which is distinct from empathy, can be a roadblock. Mm -hmm. Even something like praise or, oh, don't worry, it'll be okay. You're real smart. You'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. Roadblock to what? Roadblock to the process of self-exploration. And sometimes if I'm too quick to solve your problem for, for you, maybe even I do have a good idea how to solve your problem. But that good idea is like it's more coming from my world than deeply listening to you. Mm -hmm. But even if I do have a good idea, then I might be sending the message that, well, Xavier, I know you can't do it on your own, but don't worry. David's here to rescue you. <laughs> I might be sending a very disempowering message. And again, e even if my idea is good, all in all, it could be disempowering for your process of of fully connecting with, with your personal power. And so – Roadblocks to self-exploration, often it's like it's coming from my world rather than me being fully connected with your world. The advice I give, the solutions I give, the praise I give, the, the labeling, oh, you're just a complainer, oh, you're so lazy. It's my world. It's, it's, it's me imposing my world on you rather than and this is often effective, you playing the role of mirror and showing your understanding of my world, and in doing that, you help me to see myself. And in that sense, you support me to stand for and achieve the most sublime goal of the human form of life. And this is my point of view, of course. My point of view is that the most valuable thing we can do with life and relationships is support each other in self-discovery, in supporting each other to distinguish reality from illusion, starting within ourselves and to come to our authentic selves and to support each other to not be fear-driven and live through masks and facades and just kind of trying to survive another day, supporting each other to, to thrive from from our genuine core. Hmm. And so if you support me in that by helping me see myself, then you're really being a friend. Hmm. Yeah, I I find your words very resounding and you know what I get from that is through effective communication you're holding the space for the other person, you're entering their world enough so that they can find the answer for themselves, right? Yes. Yeah, nice, nicely expressed. Yeah. So, you know, something that I noticed in the course was, you know, there's there are these things that uh, also in your book uh, that are labeled grungies, and you know, we have these sort of excuses, n not sort of, they're actual excuses that we use, and they can be anything from, you know, body pains to anxiety to, you know, there's something going on. It it gives a sort of way to escape out of that scenario, that moment, 
that feeling that you're experiencing in the in the midst of this sort of self-discovery that's happening for you that you're using as an excuse to eject out of that situation. And can you go into grungies and, and what that means exactly? Sure. We, we use this term grungy to indicate what I'll call unhealthy states of being. Unhealthy means ways of being that take us further away from self-discovery, from self-realization, from self-awareness. They are life-alienating emotional and behavioral strategies rather than life-promoting emotional and behavioral ways of being. And the way you described it, yeah, they could be forms of escape. Escape or avoidance of responsibility can be a payoff. Let's take, for example, something like the, the emotion of sadness. Certainly, sadness has its healthy, healthy component. There is, like, let, let's say if someone very dear to us dies, passes away, then if the next day I was like, no, I don't feel any sadness. I don't feel any, any grief or sadness. That would seem strange. It would be healthy and natural to experience sadness and grief. Okay, that's healthy. That's not grungy. Now, let's say if five years after that person died, I'm still so devastated and immersed in sadness, grief, depression, I can't, I can't function. I, I, I can hardly get out of bed in the morning. Mm-hmm. Okay, now that's not natural anymore. Then we might say that's probably grungy. And again, not necessarily consciously, but maybe less than consciously, we're getting some payoff for that toxic, unhealthy emotion. Maybe it's a payoff of avoiding responsibility. Maybe a payoff of sympathy. Maybe a payoff of getting attention. And in my book and in the seminars, we go through quite, a, quite an extensive list of common grungies and the payoffs we get for them. Personally, I I found myself, you know, really using a lot of different grungies uh, just to to sort of run away from facing myself, you know, and and just getting out of things that made me uncomfortable, things that I found were difficult for me to face. And when I started to push past this idea of you know, pain, physical pain or anxiety or, you know, being nervous or being shy or, you know, being angry, this sort of interference or friction within myself that that I was able to resolve by recognizing this, simply giving it awareness. I'm inspired to, to hear your courageous process of introspection that was catalyzed in your experience in the Safato seminar and through reading my book, Relationships That Work, The Power of Conscious Living. And yeah, I, I appreciate your vulnerability, Xavier, uh, that uh, you see that you were using different grungy states of being or even physical states to to avoid being present with some painful realities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So, you know, I, I want to get into, this was an important part of not only your book, but also the the course for me was agreements and your word. How important are the agreements that we make to ourselves and others? We do emphasize that aspect of life. To answer your question, it's really important. It's really important to keep your agreements. That's not so much where I come from. Where I come from is that for a healthy, rich, fulfilling life, of courageous introspection and creating meaningful accomplishment and satisfying relations, it is really important for myself and pretty much everyone I've ever known to honestly look at our relationship with our word, our relationship with commitment, our relationship with our promises, to be to be aware of what is our relationship with our word to ourselves. And our words, our our agreements to others, what's our relationship and what are the effects of that relationship? And to be aware of that. And maybe in taking a look at that, we'll be really satisfied with what we see. Or maybe we'll see, hmm, 
I see in this relationship here, in that relationship there, I have a weak relationship with my word. And then the result is that in my workplace, there's a really low trust culture. And in this family relationship, people don't take me seriously when I, when I say I'll do something because they, they felt so let down by me. And when I really let myself feel, that feels terrible. And actually, if I look at my, my commitments with myself, I keep them so rarely, I've stopped taking myself seriously. And I feel shame about that. Or here's this relationship there where I'm like 95, 99%. When I do something, when I say something, I do it. I'm a man of my word. And that feels so solid. So we, we do give people opportunities in our programs to take a look at their relationship with their agreements. It is, it is said in the beginning was the word. So mm-hmm. just as the Supreme creates with the word, we get to take a look. What am I creating in my life with my word? And, and again, we might find, hey, I'm, I'm, real, I'm really inspired by what I'm creating with my word. Or, well, here's, here are some relationships, maybe a relationship with myself, where I'm really self-sabotaging. I'm, I'm really uh, destroying what I say I want by having a loose relationship with my word. So we're, we invite people to take a, word, a look. And it's not for me to judge, like you have a good relationship with the word, you you should keep your promises more or whatever. Just I I create opportunities in personal coaching and in seminars for people to take a look. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really powerful for me, you know, and even before the course, you know, it's it. my word is something that I live by. I feel that when you give someone your word, I mean, that's, that's what you have. That's, that's what determines who you are, what your character is. And, and that relationship with yourself, that, that connection of, are you being honest with yourself in your inner dialogue is equally, if not more important. So that you're covering it in the course, I think is a beautiful thing and that you're getting people to acknowledge it and face it and look at it there there are a lot of different types of people who take the course and uh, just speaking personally i i think there was at least one to three times where i was in full breakdown you know like i was breaking down i had to leave the room and i mean there were a lot of people there and yeah. and i just and i just couldn't bear to be in that why why do you think that type of reaction happens when when so when someone is facing themselves why is it so difficult for us to look at ourselves, like sort of looking in the mirror and and seeing that? Why why is that so hard? Well, it seems to me that much of our activity is directed towards avoiding pain, towards numbing experience. Much much of human life activity, sadly, is in one sense, it's directed away from honest introspection, right? Like, enjoy this with your eyes, enjoy this with your ears, enjoy this with your tongue. Add layers of intoxication on already layers of illusion and delusion. Hmm. So much of life is is externally driven for most people. St. Saint, Saint Francis said, we are searching for what is searching. And so in our different activities and and different uh, goals and accomplishments and attainments externally, whether it's in finances or career or relationships, we're always seeking an experience, an experience that is intrinsic to the spiritual being having a human experience. But as St. Francis said, we we're tending to run away from ourselves. And basically, yeah, in the Safatov seminars, we design it to take away the escape hatches. Of course, if someone chooses to leave the room, they can. Mm-hmm. It's uncomfortable. I mean, you know, in, in every seminar, foundational seminar, advanced seminar, Sofitov 3, that the, 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 the vast range of human experiences there, joy, affection, pain, sadness, anger, rage, tenderness, and 
um, the only one that's not there is is boredom or comfort. That's how we grow ourselves, right? We 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 stretch out of our comfort zone, and here it's not like an external stretch; it's it's internally shining the light, shining the light on areas that I've chosen consciously or less than consciously to to keep in the shadows. Hmm. And so, shining the light there, it's <clears throat> certainly can be scary, frightening, and also liberating and free yeah yeah it's it's such a powerful thing when you start to make you know the unconscious conscious and when you when you start to sort of shine that light as you said onto those things where you know we typically run away from in our everyday and um, you know, not just in, in our behaviors, but in the internal dialogue that we are having with ourselves. Mm. Yes. I, you know, I want to know about win-win scenarios, win-win situations, because this is, this is sort of my mantra. This is what I live by. I am mm-hmm. so glad that this was part of your teachings and, mm. and what you're, what you're demonstrating. Why is it so important that we execute or are involved in win-win scenarios again i'll emphasize the importance is consciousness awareness and so i think that most people like yourself they want unity harmony synergy win-win scenarios in the world in communities in households and so also in the course I'm not really going like, you should play win-win in your life. I am, again, as facilitators, we create opportunities to take a look. What what quality of game am I playing? And how satisfied am I with that? Because many people might say, I, I mean, I've seen just thousands and thousands of people. They, well, of course I'm a win-win person. Yes, I'm a win-win person. And then they'll be like in a particular situation for example in the Safatov seminar where they really get to take a look not theoretically or abstractly they get to take a look what game am i am i actually pe- playing in my life in this relationship with my employees with my colleagues with my friends with my spouse what game am i, am I actually playing and often they find wow i'm playing i'm playing win lose or i'm playing I don't care, play not to lose. And then with that awareness, then if they choose, they get to transform that to win-win. And win-win is based on empathy, right? Because we can talk win-win, but if I'm not really understanding, Xavier, what what does a win look like for you in my relationship with you, then in the name of win-win, I can do this and that. But if I'm not connected with with what's really a win for you, then um, there's no way I'm, it's, it's unlikely I'm going to create win-win. I'm thinking of one woman and she took the seminars. Also, she was a coaching client of mine mm-hmm. and she saw herself as a win-win person. And she was looking at a particular situation with her supervisor at work. She, she felt mistreated by him and like sometimes humiliated by him. And she saw herself that she was, she was just being humble and tolerant, maybe playing, lose win but really trying for win win but then anyhow she took a look at herself and it was painful for her and she saw no she wasn't playing win win or even lose win she was playing lose lose because it was difficult for her to admit but in coaching she saw that actually she would gossip about him to others she would subtly covertly try to make him look bad to others in the office and and so by in, in the seminars and coaching, she was holding, she got to look into the mirror and she saw, cause she didn't see herself as like a, you know, as a backbiting gossipy lose, lose person, but she saw that's what I'm doing. It was so shameful for her to see. And it was liberating. Hmm. Cause, cause then she thought, okay, I'm making a dead, this is shameful for me to see. I'm embarrassed about it. Mm-hmm. And I'm making a choice starting tomorrow, going into that office. Um, I'm showing up differently. And I'm standing. I'm standing for a different quality of relationship. Mm, 
Wow. I mean, that sounds like such a powerful realization for her. Um, you know, I think connected to this, this sort of win-win aspect and realizing that is a sense of ex- expectation. And, you know, there's, there's this really great example that you use involving a jar and expectation and the expectation that we have for others. And, when we put that into the reality of things, that that jar never really goes anywhere as far as the level of the water in the jar. Mm. Can, can you clarify that for us, please? Yes. In the seminars and in my book, we, we use that graphic imagery. It's the jar. And the full jar represents our expectations of another person. And then let's say the reality of the other person is 20% of those expectations or 40 or 30 or 60, whatever. Okay. So the reality is the jar is filled 30% and the full jar represents my, the, the expectations that I'm emotionally attached to um, in regards to the other person. So typically what we do is we'll fill the rest of the 70% with resentment. Because the person isn't living up to what what you've preset as expectations for them. Yeah, sometimes it's said that that expectations are premeditated resentments. Mm-hmm. I really like that. I don't mean to you know put this all in one little basket because there's it involves so much, but the external usually reflects the internal. What's mm-hmm. going on with us in our inner dialogue and what's going on with us in ourselves, in our minds, is usually what's what's being manifested in our lives. So, you know, what do you say, David, to someone who is, you know, facing an obstacle, you know, facing something that they seem to not be able to get past? Mm-hmm. You know, how do you get someone to examine that wall, that barrier? Well... I utilize a few approaches with others and with myself in my own barriers. And I encourage to try on a stance of 100% personal responsibility. Hmm. A stance that I am 100% responsible for my experience of life and for the results in my life in all areas of my life. And I encourage others to adopt that stance, at least to try it on. Sometimes I use the example like, okay, like we might try on a new set of clothes and see if we like it, see if it fits, see if we like how it looks. And if we don't like it, then I I can go back to my old set of clothes. So I'll often suggest, request, strongly encourage that let's, let's say, okay, for the three days of this seminar, try on the set of clothes of I am 100% the source of my experience of life and the results in my life, including every relationship, every, every, every emotion, every, every result, including the status of my bank account and my spiritual practice and my health. I'm 100% responsible for that and the source of that. And then – after the three-day seminar or the seven-day seminar, if you prefer the viewpoint of I'm a victim of circumstances, go back to that. Mm-hmm. I'm asking at least try on this point of view, this perspective that I, I'm 100% responsible and see what your experience is. And if you like it, keep the new set of clothes. If not, go back to your former set of clothes. And and I, I've, I've seen thousands of examples where when people agree to do that, even if they don't agree with it conceptually or philosophically, but they're saying, okay, I'll try it on hypothetically and I'll, and I'll get into it. I'll try it for a day or three. I, I've seen so many people create um, incredible, profound transformation of life. Yeah, yeah, it's really empowering when you let go of that, that victimhood that we create for ourselves as an internal dialogue. Now, I want to get into you know, something related, which is authenticity. You know, it, I think this is it's so important to be who we are, you know, and and I, I think often we put on these sort of alternative masks so that people see us in a certain way that 
there's something with you within you that isn't connecting mm. and you're not being your authentic self. How important is authenticity? Why is that so important? Well, <laughs> to to experience life, it seems like by definition it's important. I mean, okay, generally we're we're not authentic because we're giving power to fear to control us. You know, maybe at the core that fear is about, again, as I said earlier, like if, if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. So I, I, I'm not going to permit, permit myself to be authentic because, well, it, sometimes it is said that our greatest fear is that, is that others will see us as we see ourselves. And so I don't want the world to see me as, as I'm seeing myself. So let me, let me put on this happy mask or this smart guy mask or this I'll rescue you mask, or um, I'm, I'm the nice person, I'm the nice girl, I'm the nice boy, you know, we, I'm, I'm, I'm the funny one, I'm the tough one, whatever it is. And so it comes from fear. And so this transformation in transformative communication in Safatov, it's about transforming living from fear, need, insecurity, obligation, to living from purpose, inspiration, courage, joy. And because here's the thing. Let's say if I'm living a facade out of fear or whatever. And even if it's even if it's successful, it's not satisfying, it's not fulfilling because I know it's not me that they're loving, that they're caring about, that they're giving affection to and respect and and belong. It's not me, it's just some facade I'm putting out there. So it's not real life whereas when I'm willing to like show up, here I am. Here's here's my stand. Here's what I stand for. Here's my truth. And whatever, it might look good. It might not look good. It might appear brilliant or foolish. You might like me, say, in relationships, right? Uh, uh, sometimes in relationships it's said people are too scared to rock the boat, not noticing that this boat is stuck on a sandbar. Mm-hmm. It's not going anywhere. So, okay, so in relationships, okay, here I am, and I care enough about you and I care enough about our relationship to, uh, to, to not care whether you like me. I care enough about you and our relationship to not care whether you like me. Okay, so if I'm really showing up, taking a stand individually in my life, in all spheres of my life, okay, then the love that comes my way, it's real. And the hatred and the anger and the affection and the inspiration and the admiration and the respect and the rejection. Okay, so it's, some of it's painful, some of it's hurtful, some of it's joyful, and it's real. It's real life. So that's why genuineness is important. Mm, yes. Wow. Love it, man. I love it. Um, you know, I, I really want to get to a, a part in the, in the course where we talked about you know getting to a point where the the obstacles in our lives don't affect us. You know, the, you use uh, a quantum physics example, which yeah. which I thought was brilliant. But can you talk about uh, obstacles and reaching from one point to another and, and getting there in a way that's a little bit different than traditionally sort of held, you know, conception goes? Yeah. Uh, Xavier, thanks for inviting me to speak about those principles we use the terms the principles of consciousness in the result as opposed to consciousness in the obstacles and the principle the principle of clear intention and so the principle is that spirit is superior to matter we could ask a hundred people what does spiritual mean to you we might get a hundred different responses so to give an idea of, of what it means to me because I mean something quite concrete by it. I mean, in 2014, I was in uh, Colorado, a town called Golden, Colorado, and I was giving a talk at a – it was a veterans hospital. The director of the hospital was there. And it, was, it was mostly doctors, nurses, medical personnel. And I, I started the presentation right at the beginning, and I said, okay, let's say someone comes to you and says, I hurt my finger. Now, just in that simple phrase, my finger – there are two entities. There's the finger and the owner of the finger. So who are you treating, I asked. Who are you treating, the finger or the owner of the finger? Hmm. And there was a silence. And after a few moments, the hospital director, he said, well, David, that's a simple question, but you know, we've never thought about it. And I went on to say, it's very important 
Because the finger essentially is made of the same stuff as this chair or this table. It's dead matter. There's no healing potency in the finger. The healing potency is in the owner of the finger. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in, in, in your seminar, I, I ask the participants to imagine you're looking at a photo of yourself from when you were five years old. And when you look at that photo, do you say, who is this person? Who is this stranger? Who is this person? No. I say, that's me. That's David when I was five. That's Xavier when I was five. That's, mm. that's, that's Michael. That's Mary when I was five. Okay. Now, we know from chemistry there's not one atom, not one molecule in your body now that was there when you were five. So the physical has completely 100% changed, yet there's some constant identity that I call David. And so that constant identity that continues despite the complete change of the physical, that's what we're referring to as the spiritual being. So spirit is superior to matter. Spirit is where the healing potency, the growth the growth potency is. And when – so we intrinsically are an irreducible quanta of consciousness inhabiting a, a physical body at this time. So when, when the self turns towards itself in self-realization – and turns to source in a spirit of loving devotion, then no material obstacles can get in the way of manifesting the goal because spirit is superior to matter when as, as that irreducible quantum of consciousness, when as spiritual beings were living in conscious living in self-realization, the self turning towards itself in self-awareness, and turning to source in a spirit of loving devotion, then, then dead matter, no material obstacle can get in the way. When, when we're selling out our power to self-defeating beliefs and grungy stuff and facades and masks and giving our power to fear rather than living courageously and from inspiration, then so many things will get in the way of achieving relatively simple goals. So the seminars and all of our programs, there's quite a sublime, full, complete philosophical basis and simultaneously it's experiential. It's not just theoretical or abstract, though we invite anyone to apply your intellect and philosophical mind to, to the principles and to give yourself to the process and have a transformational experience transforming from misidentification with external mask to identifying with the the, the diamond that is the self. Mm, yeah, wow. Um you know there's there's so much here in the book within the seminar and you know it's difficult to compress it all into an hour long conversation you know so we're just we're kind of scratching the surface with this and you know, it's kind of the tip of the iceberg here for another analogy but you know i i want to know what's the payoff for you here david i mean you know there's we've discussed so many different things and i, I know that you give you're all when you're doing these seminars you and marie like you, you both are so involved and from my perception it's a it's a genuine desire to help others why do you do this i mean why why dedicate your life to this well yeah i i i want to serve others in 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 the highest way possible and these programs of sophitov institute like this foundational seminar that you experienced is the best way I know how to do that. A more a more self self absorbed response is yeah for because I I I get so much fulfillment. I I mean I I do give myself I do give myself uh, 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 fully and and it's it's energizing for me. It's energizing. It's so rewarding for me to 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 get to serve people. And challenge people in their adventure of self discovery. It's I so I'm, I'm serving them for for their benefit, for them to lead much richer, more fulfilling lives, and that's so deeply satisfying for me. I I feel myself living purposefully, and I, I feel, my, my, feel myself living with inspiration. If I had ten billion dollars. What I would be doing now, here on the Thursday afternoon, 
is speaking with Xavier in this <laughs> radio interview. Hmm. What I would be doing later this evening is conducting a session with a coaching client that I'm scheduled with. And what I'd be doing May 18th to 20th is conducting a Safito foundational seminar. So I feel just very blessed and fortunate that that I get to serve in this way. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, I'm I'm deeply thankful that I get to do this. Uh, David, I love it, man. I, and I'm glad that we could, you know, have this exchange and and bring you onto the show and and talk at least a little bit and you know touch on some of the things that you guys cover in the course. You know, I, I speaking from personal experience, it really did affect me and my life, and I'm planning on pursuing it um, further. And you know, I, I'm planning on taking the advanced course and and more. So. You know, I, where can people find your work? Where can people, uh, you know, get to the website and, and, and pick up the book? So our website, our website is sattvatov.com. Should I, I'll spell that. Sure. Uh, S as in Stephen, A, T, Thomas, V, Victor, A, T, Thomas, O, V, Victor, E, dot com. And... There is a special website for my book. It's relationships that work dash book dot com. Also, the book is available um, at the Sotfitov dot com website, and there's information and videos about the seminars, and and visitors to the website can register for the seminars. And you know, I I, I welcome listeners to write to me if they have any questions. Uh, my email is David to B as in Brian Wolf. W O L F at sattvatov.com. And uh, if they have any questions about the seminars, they can visit the website. They can contact me, read my book. And um, yeah, we have our seminars, book, coach training programs, individual coaching. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And did you say, I think I heard you say that um, there's a there's a foundational course that you're about to do. Right. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Where is it that? Start, it's it starts uh, uh, four weeks from tomorrow, May eighteenth to twentieth, at the Drury Hotel in Gainesville, Florida. That's the Safatov Foundational Seminar. The next Safatov Advanced Seminar is June tenth to sixteenth, also in Gainesville, Florida. The Advanced Seminar will be held at the Gainesville Retreat Center in Gainesville. Yes. David, I, I really want to thank you so much for your presence again, man. I, I, I really, you know, gained so much from, from the course and, and the book. I'm really glad we could do this. Um, thank you for being here. Guys, this is The Human Experience. Thank you so much for listening. Please do check out my guest's work. His name is Dr. David B. Wolf. Uh, the book is called Relationships That Work, The Power of Conscious Living. And you can get to the website www sattvatov.com we will make that available that link available for you guys below in the posting below thank you guys so much for listening you will hear from us next week hey guys so i wanted to remind you of our patreon page where you can become a voice in what we're doing there are all sorts of different levels that you can donate to our cause here and it helps support the show. It helps support what we're doing. If you go to patreon.com slash the human XP, if one of our episodes has helped you, if the work we're doing resonates with you, help us keep this ship afloat. So get to patreon.com slash the human XP and support us if you can. It really makes a big difference and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening.